Good day and welcome to Drew's Book Reviews. What if I told you the entire universe as you know it is wrapped around these itty bitty teeny weeny little tiny vibrating stringies? But that's not even all. What if I told you that these itty bitty teeny weeny stringies are actually wrapped around these dimensions we can't even comprehend? I mean, I'm not talking about just the usual spatial dimension height, height, depth, width, and of course time. I'm talking about up to 11 spatial dimensions, not just the four that we're used to. What if I told you that? If you want to know more, stay tuned. This, this is coming right up. Okay, if you hadn't picked up on it in my intro there, today's book review is going to be a non-fiction book review. So today's book is going to be on Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe, Super Strings, Hidden Dimensions, and the Quest for the Ultimate Theory. Now, Mr. Brian Greene, if you don't already know, he is a theoretical physicist who is currently working for NYU, I believe it. And he is quick becoming one of my favorite nonfiction writers, especially in the areas of science. I absolutely love the weirdness of quantum mechanics and quantum physics, particle physics, all that subatomic stuff where the universe ceases to make sense and the laws of physics as we know it break down into chaos, which has long been a problem in the scientific community because quantum mechanics, quantum physics, all that good stuff consistently is shown to be true while simultaneously contradicting the classical physics of the classical universe that we know of. And that that's long been an issue with science is these two conflicting ideas that both seem to be proven true while both contradicting the laws of known physics, essentially one contradicting the other. So Brian Greene has taken this idea, this problem that science has had, and he's written this whole book about what has been developed to help deal with the unifying theory, the grand unifying theory, the ultimate theory of everything, so that these two contradictory states could eventually be merged to work together into a single unified theory that makes sense on a whole, so that the, we have a better understanding of our universe and place in it. Now, of course, as we all know, quantum mechanics and particle physics, quantum theory, all this stuff, like this is complex stuff. It's confusing stuff. Even in the world of theoretical physics, physicists are confused by some of this stuff. And one of the great ways that he describes it, and I really like it, because at one point he was talking about, oh, there's like five, there were five different string theories. And you can kind of explain it, like imagine there's a starfish for a moment, and each arm of the starfish is a different theory, string theory. And then in the middle, we have this like even better theory, which is referred to as M theory, which is this idea that uh, molds or joins everything together. Whereas previously, we were only looking at the individual arms of string theory, so we didn't see the connection, which is where M theory had come along. And of course, before with quantum physics and qu particle physics versus classical physics, we didn't see how it all connected and string theory started to bridge that gap to bring us to a fuller, better understanding of everything. One of the really cool things about string theory that I really liked, and I liked how Brian Greene explains this is, you know, we're, we're used to this idea or this concept of, you know, only four spatial dimensions essentially. So you got your height, how tall you are, your width, how wide you are. How, your depth, how, how deep you are, like if you were to put your hand through me, how deep would it go kind of idea. And that, so those are our three physical dimensions in the universe that we're familiar with, but there's also the dimension of time for a fourth dimension. What's really cool about string theory and this idea that there's these little easy beasy teeny weeny tiny vibrating stringies right into the, the very, very depths and subatomic levels that they're wrapped around these like infinitesimally small alternate dimensions of reality that we simply cannot see. This is a hypothesized or theorized 
reality to it. And the reason this came up is because string theory itself, the mathematics behind it, strongly suggested that such a thing existed. Now, how many alternate dimensions exist? That has been a subject that, based on what Brian Greene is saying in this book here, has been debated amongst physicists, but it's up to 11 dimensions, including the, dimen the three physical and one of time that we're familiar with but in total up to 11 dimensions. Now just the idea of 11 dimensions makes no sense to me at all. I mean, I can't even conceptualize what a different dimension to the physical universe would look like. But Brian Greene does a really good job of helping to explain why perhaps to us it's inconceivable using the example of imagining a world in a two-dimensional plane with two-dimensional people, or you could go back or forth, left or right, and that's it. So you got your width, and and height dimensions essentially, and that's it. It's two dimensions, that's it. Uh, and one of these line people from line land or two dimensional land hypothesizes the third dimension and how confusing that would be and how hard it would be for people to accept that. But on their very basic level, at their lowest level, they can only ever conceive of two dimensions, but us on the bigger level can conceive of this third dimension. But also, if we were to go much smaller, we would perhaps start to see these other dimensions ourselves. But of course, that's impossible. But just the idea of how these little vibrating cosmic strings are wrapped around the dimensions is, is pretty cool. I think, personally, I lo love the ideas presented and the opportunity do we have to learn so much more. <clears throat> Guess we'll just wait for the garbage to go by. Kind of noisy out there. One thing I'm finding Brian Green to be really, really good at, and which I really appreciate because I love this stuff. I love this quantum theory stuff. As confusing as it is and as hard as it is to understand, Brian Greene has been really, really good at kind of explaining things on a basic level with analogies that help us understand so much better what is going on. And I definitely kind of put some things in new perspective for me in terms of uh, science and ideas such as the constant of the speed of light that I hadn't thought about before. Now, we all knew that the speed of light was constant. I understood that absolutely always understood that the speed of light is constant but I never really thought about it in the terms that Brian Green laid out before just as an example the way he explained it was imagine for a moment that you have an object coming towards you at a hundred miles per hour you want to get away from this object so you start running at a hundred miles per hour the relative velocity of that object coming towards you would be its 100 mile an hour motion minus your 10 mile hour speed away from it. In effect, 90 miles per hour is the relative approach velocity. Well, relativity breaks down with the speed of light. And how he explains this, the speed of light is 677 million miles an hour. And then if we imagine for a moment that we're in a spaceship moving 177 million miles an hour away from the light coming towards us, you would think, relatively, the, the light would be approaching at 577 million miles an hour. So that's the speed of light minus your velocity equals 577 million miles an hour. No, no matter how fast you're going, the speed of light, that light is still coming towards you at 677 million miles an hour. So effectively, if you're moving away at 100 million miles an hour, and the speed of light is 677 million miles an hour, then light is relativistically moving at 777 million miles an hour in order to remain constant at 677 million miles an hour. I'm probably explaining this poorly. Go read this book. He does a better job of it. Really, he does. But with that constant, it's a new way of thinking it, that no matter how fast you're moving, light will still be moving at the same speed irregardless of relative motion of the object or the individual, it will remain constant. And that that's just kind of mind blowing to me, I guess, which is weird because we all know the speed of light is constant. 
but never really thought about it in terms of how the speed of light shows the breakdown of relativity in our universe. And that's just a really interesting way to think about it for me. It kind of puts it in a new perspective. So it's not so much that I learned something new so much as I kind of understood it from a new perspective I hadn't really thought about before, which I thought was really cool. And one of the other really cool examples I enjoyed from this book is the example of astronaut in space. He's floating through the black void of nothingness. You know, as far as he's concerned, he's not moving. There's no motion involved. He's just there. Off in the distance, he sees a light. And that light seems to be getting closer and getting bigger as it's coming towards him. And that light turns out to be another astronaut which flies by him. Now, from his perspective, this astronaut's perspective, he is remaining motionless. He's not moving. There's no motion there. It's the other astronaut that's moving. However, from the other astronaut's perspective, he is the one that is coming towards the other astronaut. So it's all relative because both from their viewpoints are right. Both are staying still and it's the other guy that's moving. But how can both be right? And that's essentially how this idea of relativity works. And I thought that was a really great example to highlight this. So it's a lot of examples throughout his book like that, that really help to solidify the examples utilized to explain the theories and concepts within this book and within string theory. And essentially the whole book is about the history of string theory, where it started, why it came about in the first place, and how it's progressed to where it is now as eventually leading to what is now known as M theory. Um, you know, some refer to it as the magic theory, the magically unifying everything or membrane theory, but there's so much to the, the string theory itself. This book certainly does not get into the nitty gritty, deep depth details of string theory. There's too much that are really explained. And I think considering the complicated issues, the concepts uh, and the mathematics involved in high end theoretical physics, physics, Brian Greene does a remarkable job of keeping it simple and breaking it down. Now, I won't pretend I, I understand everything. These Kalabi Yao spaces he keeps talking about where all these extra dimensions are wrapped around these tiny Kalabi Yell spaces. I don't really understand all that. Uh, I, I mean, I kind of get what he's talking about, but at the same time, I don't really get it. But that being said, again, Brian Greene's breaking it down as simply as I think he can without detracting from what he's trying to say. And I think overall, he does a really good job of that. And I don't expect to understand everything when it comes to this world of theoretical particle physics. But I really enjoy how Brian Greene is helping me understand these concepts better. I mean, if you're into science, if you're into, you know, physics and whatnot and understanding of fundamental building blocks of our universe, I would definitely recommend Brian Greene. He's definitely becoming one of my favorite nonfiction writers. I've got several of his books on the shelf. I'm pretty sure I've already got a review on one of his other books on this channel as well. And you can bet I'm going to be reading more Brian Greene throughout the year. Absolutely love this book. Um, I did give it a three out of five stars on Goodreads. Not so much because I think Brian Greene did a, you know, an, just an okay job. I think he did a great job explaining the concepts as best he could uh, to keep it as simple as possible. But mainly because there were a few things that I didn't quite understand what he was talking about or I kind of vaguely get it in concept but not really understand it. I don't think that's necessarily Brian Greene's fault, but it's just one of those, one of the reasons why I gave it a three out of five stars instead of like an amazing four or five. Definitely, I still really enjoyed it. There were some statements within this book that honestly I could say I didn't really agree with, I guess, but then I'm not a physicist. So one of those things that Brian Greene had said within this book was, that there's nothing smaller than a string. I love the way Brian Greene broke down what these strings are. So building up from the individual fundamental building blocks. Now I do disagree with his perspective or his conclusion on strings being there, there can't be anything further and I'll get to why in just a moment. But essentially if you imagine the individual letters in a word, that, that is the cosmic string, the fundamental building block. So the letter, individual letters, 
are the strings, the individual words are the atoms, or sorry, the individual words are the particles that the strings make up. The individual sentences are like the atoms, the paragraphs, like the molecule of our world. And then the book itself is like the physical objects within this world. So his conclusion with that is that asking what are strings made of is like asking what is a letter made of. That's the fundamental starting point. Now, as a physicist, he probably knows a lot more about this than me, but he declares that there is nothing smaller. There's nothing more to it than the strings. You, they're not made up of anything. They just are. Now, to me, that was kind of a short-sighted statement, I guess. Um, you know, because at one point, now to me, to declare that that is the smallest fundamental building block of the universe, that you can't go smaller, just, it doesn't sound right to me, not because I actually inherently think that there is something smaller than the cosmic strings that are made up of these different vibrational patterns to create the universe, but because at one time, Nobody thought there was anything smaller than an atom. It was believed that that is the smallest you could get. You can't go smaller. It's made up of nothing else but the atom is the atom and you can't go smaller. Then along comes the discovery of the particle, the electrons, protons, neutrons, gluons, quarks, uh, you know, all, all these different particles that make up the individual atoms were discovered. And now we're discovering that these particles may be made up of these tiny individual strings. So every time we, the scientific community is telling you can't go smaller. And it's been shown to be wrong. So for me to declare, well, strings are made up of nothing, you can't go smaller than that, just seems maybe not the right approach, uh, maybe not the right thing. We should be careful about declaring that anything is finalized in science. And I think Brian Greene generally understands that pretty well. It's just the way it was put within the book. Kind of like, oh, wait a minute. How, how can you say that? How can you know for sure? But at the end of the day, like I said, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a physicist. I don't know. I don't know more than him. He knows far more than me about this stuff. Maybe he's right. But, you know, it it's, wouldn't be the first time that science has declared an end to that particular science or road of discovery and been proven wrong. I mean, this happens all the time in science. So... At least for me, if I were in his position, I would never declare that this is the end and that's the end of it and it can't be any smaller or there's nothing more to learn about this or that area. Because at the end of the day, science is always progressing. Science is always learning. Um, I don't know if he meant it that way, but it kind of sounded like that. But in any case, I'm going on too much about that, getting a little bit nitpicky there. At the end of the day, this was a great read. I did enjoy it. And definitely if you are interested in physics and science and universe and all that kind of good stuff alternate dimensions definitely recommend brian green loving his books great great books to read to help you understand very complex ideas within the realm of quantum mechanics and quantum physics absolutely loved it highly recommend it and i do want to thank you so much for watching if you like this video please hit that like button don't forget to subscribe i'm also active of course on twitter and instagram primarily and uh, I do have a Discord, I'll link that below. I also do have a Patreon. If you wanna support me there, links in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, keep on reading. Bye.